All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the elective session, Primary Care on Demand, Where and When Patients Need It. Uh, my name is Dr. Aditi Bustles, and I will be the MC for today's session, and I'm honored to be helping facilitate this discussion amongst two uh, amazing providers and leaders in the field and want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, my background is um, in child health, specifically in child maltreatment prevention. So the concept and idea of home visiting is something that I'm very passionate about and looking forward to learning from our speakers. Your presence and participation are truly invaluable as we navigate through an essential topic in the field of primary care today. And so we'll start a little bit by providing uh, some context and background uh, especially as it relates to enhancing access to care and what that looks like in PCF. I'll introduce your uh, peer presenters, and then we will um, jump right in to hearing about their approach around home visiting. And of course, we'll uh, include some time for you all to ask questions and learn from each other. So let's jump right in. Our goal today is to really share how one practice is enhancing access to care for their patients and seeing positive impacts in their aim to reduce uh, acute hospital uh, utilization or AHU. So let's take a moment now to look at some of the key data and insights from our most recent care delivery reporting period in 2023. 20% 20 of practices leveraged payment flexibilities to offer home visits for care management activities. And interestingly, a higher percentage of RG3 and 4 practices, so 47% and 87% respectively, have been providing payment flexibilities for home visits compared to RG1 and 2 practices, which you can see on the screen is 19% and 23% respectively. So what does this mean? Well, these insights indicate a trend of alternative care delivery methods, particularly home visiting. And what does this mean for our discussion today? Well, as we move forward, you will hear from internal medicine faculty associates in New Jersey who have utilized these strategies effectively. They have specifically developed a home visiting program that has helped them in lowering their AHU. This example will provide us with practical insights and strategies that then can be tested in other practices. So really the ultimate goal today is not just to learn, but to apply these strategies in a real world scenario for effective patient-centered care delivery. And so I know that I am very much looking forward to an engaging and informative discussion with all of you. So before I turn it over to our distinguished speakers, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you and your practice. We have a quick question that should have popped up on the screen in the form of a poll, and it's to learn about whether or not your practice provides home visits for patients. So I'll give you just a second to, to fill out that poll so we can see what you all are working on. All right, so it seems like the result is we are half and half. So about 50% of you do have some kind of home visiting program while others do not. And that's great. We're very much looking forward to hearing from all of you in terms of maybe where you are in your journey of incorporating this practice or where you'd like to be if it's not something that you currently have. So we can now move into hearing from our uh, speakers. So Dr. Maddie and Dr. Patilla, over to you for introductions and for us to jump in. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bossos for um, giving us the opportunity to present our program here today. So I'm uh, Dr. Brenda Matti Orozco. I'm currently the medical director for Internal Medicine uh, Faculty Associates. We're part of an integrated health system in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, under Atlantic Medical Group and Atlantic Health System. We are primarily a primary care practice, and we've been uh, part of the journey from CPC Plus uh, and now with Primary Care First as well. Um, I'm also currently the Chief of General Internal Medicine and Palliative Medicine at Morristown Medical Center. Um, so I'd like to uh, turn things first to Dr. Petilla to introduce herself and then uh, we'll move, in, move on to the presentation. Uh, Jess? 
<clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahdi, and thank you, Dr. Bussels, um, for having us here today. Um, we're very um, um, <clears throat> um, excited to tell you about our practice, um, specifically the home visit practice. So I'm Jessica Pitilla. I am an internist and a geriatrician. I've been in practice for about 20 years. I'm not new to home visits. I've done home visits um, in my prior um, um, career. And so this is sort of like circling back. Um, so my, my role, I am the medical director for the primary care at home program, um, which is our house calls program. And I am also the regional medical director for Atlantic Medical Group in the central region area. I um, just wanted to say that, you know, our practice started as a patient-centered medical home, which actually gave the foundation for us to be a CPC plus practice. And now moving on to um, being a participant in the PCF initiative. So um, our journey to uh, implementing primary care at home really started about six years ago. So it didn't um, come about uh, automatically. Uh, we had to revise our uh, proposal uh, several times until it really met the needs also, not just of our practice, but also of the system. Um, and our, our vision here initially, before we were in primary care first, the vision for implementing primary care at home or a house call program was really to provide a full uh, complement of services in the continuum of care. And as an integrated healthcare system, it's I think having a house call program is really a uh, key um, service that we need to provide uh, for our patients. Um, so we finally were able to implement the uh, primary care at home uh, in about, a, you know, almost two years ago. Uh, and we decided to set a criteria. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we set up the program for success. So, uh, and we primarily wanted to focus on older adults, those who are 65 and older, uh, and those residing in Morris County, and those who are meeting the criteria of being homebound under the Medicare definition of homebound. Uh, and being homebound means either they have to exert extreme effort to get around, uh, where they need uh, assistive devices um, to leave the home, or special transportation to leave the home, or another person to accompany them uh, when they're living uh you know, when they leave home, uh, as well as if there's any medical contraindication for uh, leaving the home as well. Um, and our vision was first to recruit a full-time nurse practitioner uh, and hoping that we, if successful, we were going to add another full-time nurse practitioner. Um, and um, based on that, we were able to initiate the implementation um, and we recognize that despite the advancement of technology where we've been able to avail of virtual visits and telemedicine, the, it doesn't really replace, um, you know, providing a high touch uh, for our patients. Uh, there are patients who really need to be examined. And I think being at, at the right place at the right time and in their home environment will provide us greater information as to what they will need in order to age in place and really to support them in that process. So uh, our practice has 40% uh, of our patients in the practice are over uh, the age of 65. And we knew that we need to be able to uh, at least also meet some of their needs, especially as they become more frail and really limited to the home. Um, and we did uh, convene an interdisciplinary work group. Um, I'd like actually, uh, and we also use the data feedback tool from Primary Care First, which also gave us uh, evidence uh, that the need is there and, um, and also that the impact is going to be quite measurable. Um, so I'd like actually Dr. Patilla to, uh, you know, provide more details about uh, the resources and the stakeholders and uh, our partners in this journey. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Mari. Um, so, so um, how did we um, how did we start with the with the program? I think there was a lot of work that was placed. As as Dr. Mari said, it took about six years for the home visit to actually become become a, a reality. So, um, but when the business plan was approved, between the the approval of the business plan and the beginning of uh, seeing patients, in fact, even before we hired our um, nurse practitioner, there was a lot of work placed. So um, part of that was to, um, I think one of the first things that we had to do was to really establish who our partners in the community would be. And we actually reached out to um, um, companies that would do our um, home blood draw. So we have two companies that we work with now. Um, we established that relationship prior to the beginning of the um, program. We also reached out to a few companies who would do, um, there were mobile diagnostic um, companies that would do x-rays and ultrasounds and echoes. And so we currently were actually using two um, companies. So we also, um, 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 use um, a podiatrist and there's a dentist also who does house calls. So these were the, the first really basic um, partners in the community that we had to establish. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of um, beginning um, the, um, the program, um, we established our mission. We established our mission, our vision, our goals, and our mission was to be able to um, provide direct access to our homebound patients in the M Morristown Medical Center's primary care service areas. And so we, and as what Dr. Mari said, we established our um, geographic scope, which is the Morris County area. Um, we wanted to start with that um, piece. Um, we also established our goals and our goals were really to um, be able to prevent and avoid hospitalizations, prevent our 30-day readmissions, facilitate care trans, um, transitions. And we also wanted to be able to um, enhance patient access to the homebound community in order to avoid emergency department visits. We also um, enhanced care coordination with the patient's primary care physicians um, if needed. Um, the type of visit, the type of service that we um, are giving, um, the type of, of service that we, we give would be um, primary care, meaning long-term care with the patients or transition, transitional care. So when a patient is at home, unable to go to their primary care doctor, we take care of the patients prior um, to until they can can go back to their primary care doctor's office. So we do that kind of service. So it's mo most of what we do is really um, long term primary care. Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> the care team, so our care team, um, the core care team really included um, the nurse practitioner, of course, who would go and conduct the actual house calls. Um, we have um, a dedicated CMA who would assist our clinicians with almost everything that they needed, from scheduling to patient intake, intake of insurance um, information, intake of some of the history um, and um, insurance verification, scheduling of lab um, and x-rays as needed. Um, and really the, the CMA is key because um, they provide that communication between the patients and the practice. Um, other pieces that we had to um, establish, we established, um, you know, what kind of access do we give our patients? So in terms of access, the patients are assigned a personal care um, clinician. And for any routine visits, preventive care visits, they would be scheduled with their primary care physician. If we had, if there was an urgent need for the patients to be seen, um, we had established also um, with our patients that we are really not, we, do, we, we do not do urgent same day visits. We just do not have that capacity yet, but we do um, try to schedule a virtual visit with a patient if that would be possible. 
um, and then schedule a visit within the same week. So we, we can do same week visits. We made sure that we can do same week visits, but no same day urgent visits. Um, this actually worked out well with the patients. Um, most of the patients actually do not want to be seen in, do not want to go to the emergency room um, or the urgent care um, um, facilities. So what we had done, um, we had used them very rarely though. We would use Dispatch Health, which is another company that does just urgent care visits. So for urgent care, um, we have used them, but very rarely as, you know, for the most part, we have been able to accommodate same week visits. Um, in terms of access to um, our clinicians for any medical advice, our clinicians, our NPs have cell phones. So it's not mandatory. We did not mandate for them to give the cell phones, but it was just easier for the nurse practitioner deemed that it was easier to, to give them access to the cell phone, but they would turn it off after business hours and on weekends when they're not on call. So that was the understanding that, that we had with the patients. So it just made it easier in terms of communication, but generally the patients are able to communicate via my chart um, and can send us messages or they call and talk to the dedicated CMA that we have um, in the practice. Um, coverage so we have coverage 24 hours by seven the nice thing about our model is that the primary house call, the house calls practice is embedded in a bigger practice which is um what dr mari had just described earlier we are um, um a practice of about four or five other physicians other clinicians and so if the if there is coverage and and if let's say I wasn't there, I am actually the collaborating collaborating physician, and Dr. Mari is the backup physician. So if um if um I'm not there or Dr. Mari is not available, the NPs, our clinicians who do the house calls, actually have access to the other doctors mm -hmm. in the practice. So they do not feel isolated, which can sometimes be um, a bit of a concern with patients um, with clinicians doing purely house calls. Um, so in terms of our workflows, we use, um, we use the EMR, we use Epic and we have templates that we created. And again, this is all done prior to the, um, to actually the beginning of our home visits. So we had a template, we create a template that will, um, serve the home visit, um, patient, um, and will also let us, um, obtain the data that we need to do in order to measure our performance. And so we use that and um, we actually also have um, um, communication is encouraged for clinician to clinician or clinician to staff. We use Epic uh, MyChart, we use um, the inbox, we use um, Epic Chat, we use Teams <clears throat> and we text each other. For communication between the practice and the patient, they are encouraged to use my chart or they can call if they want to or they can actually commun communicate via the cell phone with the actual with their um, NPs. <clears throat> um, workflows, the workflows um, we had we have workflows for the practice. So what we just needed to do was to just adjust it, um, adjust it to make it um adjust it for the needs of the house calls program so it was not a big shift so we already had our workflows for messaging workflows refill um workflows um result management workflows referrals and all other workflows in the practice so that was not a big um shift we just needed to um kind of tweak it a little bit um for the house calls program um the other piece too was um in terms of performance goals. As what I had mentioned before, we measure our um, hospitalizations, 30-day readmissions, 90-day readmissions. Um, in addition, we also um, do a caregiver assessment. So caregiver burden assessment, we measure that. We measure our, our um, annual wellness visits and we also measure our um, advanced care planning, um, to name a few. Um, 
Um, now, implementation. So we actually, when we implemented the practice, in terms of the geographic scope, we divided our, we divided Morris County, which is a huge county. We did divided it into four zones. So Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, and each NP had their own assignments. But if there was an urgent need to see a patient within that same week, then they had that flexibility to um, go outside of their zones. This, this worked out very well to lessen the drive. Um, as you know, in, in New Jersey, uh, um, it could it could mean um, it could be a thirty minute drive. Could mean a lot to to um, our care um, our um, NPs. Um, in terms of number of visits, we decided to do six visits a day, so three in the morning, three in the afternoon, and that worked out well. I think that gave the clinicians um, enough time to go from one um, residence to the other. Um, did you want anything else to add on, Dr. Mahdi, before we go into the... No, I think that's good. Uh, and we do uh, provide the um, comprehensive patient assessment. Mm -hmm. And um, as a palliative care clinician myself, uh, because we are dealing also with a frail population, the palliative care needs also are there. And I work collaboratively with the NP uh, anytime they need uh, assistance with symptom management. Um, they're very adept. The nurse practitioner we have is quite experienced with uh, handling advanced care planning and goals of care conversation and also has a comfort level in assessing prognosis and recommending hospice to patients uh, if appropriate. Um, so um, next slide. So uh, we started uh, on this um, with a program in the first quarter of 2022, and at the time, our acute hospital utilization was kind of in the higher um, percentile, and we wanted to actually improve it. Um, so, uh, and as you could see here in the graph, we bumped up a little bit as the program was still growing. At the time, we wanted to make sure that our, uh, and the one of the questions here is, what's the secret strategy to success? We believe uh, in starting small and then really trying to tweak the processes and making sure though that you don't that we don't over promise uh, especially if you only have one provider uh and as you could see the impact and, and the reason we we really attribute this to primary care at home in our practice is because we did not put in any new strategies except this one in order to improve our hospital utilization and i think it's pro probably tied in also to access when patients are frail uh, you know, they may not be readily able to do uh, office visits, to come to the office. And also, because of age, sometimes they're not really, or they're really reluctant to use um, telemedicine uh, for their visit. Uh, and over time, we clearly saw the impact of the house calls. Uh, we did have a bump up back to our high acute um hospital utilization uh, when our nurse practitioner actually went on um, maternity leave. So um, we're hoping to get back to our successful, to a successful strategy. Uh, but we, we are able at least to demonstrate here that there's a lot of uh, positive outcomes in uh, providing house calls. I think the patient and family experience ha have also uh, has been uh, uh, excellent. Uh, I think our, our nurse practitioners have really gotten um, positive feedback. And um, also, uh, I think they at the same time, our nurse practitioner also feel quite supported uh, because um, the one thing I was going to emphasize, aside from the full-time CMA, our practice is able to also provide other um, 
support such as behavioral health. We have behavioral health clinician in our practice that is also available to do, not necessarily to do house calls, but able to do virtual visits to provide uh, behavioral health services. We also have a social worker in our practice that's able to provide uh, case management, uh, provide, you know, um, community resources for the patient and the family that they can utilize and avail of. Um, we also have a clinical pharmacist uh, that is uh, helpful in uh, issue, issues related to polypharmacy or patients being on high risk medications or looking into drug drug interaction. Um, so uh, I think integrating a house call in an existing practice where the practice already have available resources is another strategy to success. Uh, also in making sure that the provider for house call doesn't feel too isolated. So our nurse practitioner actually also uh, can uh, bring our residents along during house call. So that also provides some uh, interaction out there in the field. It's also a great learning experience uh, for some of you who may be part of an academic or a teaching hospital. I think uh, providing the experience to residents on how to do house calls and what it's like to see patients in the home uh, has all uh, really been um, positive for us. Um, Okay, Dr. Bustles, um, are there, uh, I think there's another slide to this. Oh, no. Okay. Questions. Yes, and there yes. are many questions coming in yeah. <laughs> um, and we're very excited. So I know you touched on a little bit of this, but for those that do not yet have a home visiting program or house calls, what, is, what are some, you know, ideas or guidance that you may have in terms of convincing your organization to support a program like this? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, it took us six years. Uh, our first proposal was like a house call on steroids <laughs> with a lot of bells and whistles. And of course, when you have a lot of bells and whistles, especially if you have a lot of team members that not, may not necessarily bill for services, um, a lot of times it will get rejected. So we eventually came down to a very lean proposal and utilizing existing services uh, in our practice. So that's one. For the ones who want to start out first small before they even propose, you know, a formal house call program for the practice and, you know, before they create a budget for the C-suite to approve, one idea would be to consider um, maybe just starting out doing, providing house call one half day a week. Uh, so with one half day a week, you probably need already like a panel of about 10 patients for one half day. Because if you're planning to do, see them once a month, that's how many patients you may need to just start with one half day a week. And, you know, and see what it's like and see whether it's time consuming or not, what resources would be needed. Uh, and it can potentially replace one office session, one half day of office session. Uh, if really the practices want to start small without having to require a lot of uh, resources. So there's also the, you know, when you read through the literature about implementing house calls, about investing on what they call a medical bag with all the other equipments yeah. you don't need really also having a portable ekg or a nebulizer machine um like our ekg uh we actually did not uh request for a portable ekg because we have the ability to just refer the patient if we need an ekg uh, somebody could go in and do the ekg and send us the report um, so there are different really ways where you could start a house call program uh, and then build on that. Uh, and also really, I think we know for a fact that it's going to be in high demand. Mm -hmm. This is one of the easiest way to also build, uh, you know, good PR in the community to promote the practice because a lot of community residents view this as as healthcare providers going above and beyond mm -hmm. the expectation when they see people do house calls. Uh, it will bring in new referrals to the office. Uh, 
also if you eventually really uh, implement a formal program or service, the referrals are going to come. Uh, there is more than enough patients in the community. Um, just to give you an example, uh, Mount Sinai Health System, where we were previously at, has the largest house call program in New York City. Largest means they have a patient panel size, maybe of about 5,000. Wow. That's in New York City, where you know probably the homebound elderly in the area is beyond that. And yet they can only serve about 5,000 patients in the year. So there's enough patients really to go around. Uh, and But, you know, keep in mind, though, if you are meeting with your system leadership or your organization leadership, is that unfortunate this is not necessarily um it's, it would still be considered a loss leader because you won't be able to have the volume of patients because of the demand for for travel you know and most of these patients are really complex and you need the time to really sit down with the patient and the family uh and address their needs Dr. Patilla, um, just kind of following up on that uh, and kind of building on some of the unique, I think, roles that these um, house call providers really play, has it been in a fairly easy process to recruit uh, providers to go into the home or has it been something that you've had to get creative about? Would love to hear a little bit about how you recruited and what that has looked like and you know, what does their um, typical workload look like, you know, every day as they go do these house calls? So thank you, um, Dr. Basel. So so it it really it it has not been an easy task to recruit for a house calls um, provider because house calls is not really for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have that mindset. You want to be out in the facility. You want to go into other people's homes. You're traveling, so it, it's not for everyone. And we did have. Um, we it took us a while to be able to recruit, um, and and so it's it, it's um it has to be that particular kind of person who wants to be out there in the community. And but there are there are those um, clinicians who would want to be out in the community. Um, who would want to be um, who, who who not you know more comfortable to be out there instead of seeing patients every fifteen thirty minutes of practice? So it has not been, but we've managed to find some really really good people um, who are working with us right now. I think the one thing that we just have to keep in mind is that um, if you're starting with a small program, one practitioner, you just have to be to be ready to fill in that gap. So, for instance, when we were down to to no clinicians, at some point there was a gap there. Basically, I went in and Dr. Mari went in to, to fill that gap for um, to see the patients who needed to be seen until we we got um, we recruited and until our first practitioner came back from being on leave. Um, so, so yes, and in terms of, I just wanted to touch base also in terms of marketing in the beginning with one clinician, where we gingerly um, introduced the practice, the false calls program to the community. We marketed mainly to our building, our clinicians, our hospital, and we, we I think um, in terms of really keeping the geographic scope was key um, because we don't want to spread our, spread ourselves too thin. Um, on year two, though, we did add on a few neighboring towns outside of Morris County just because there really is a need for house calls. There will always be a need for house calls. And what the, as what Dr. Mari said, and I think I see one of the questions here, is that there are a lot of homebound patients there, and so there there is there is really a big need. I think one of the reasons why we decided to um, our criteria um, in choosing our criteria was really to be able to serve those who need it the most. It's not a concierge practice. Um, it's not for the patient's convenience. It's really to be able to reach out to those patients who are unable to come. To the yeah, um, and our provider goes, uh, uh, you know, will do the visit on their own. Um, if really there's a concern for safety, uh, depending on the neighborhood, 
uh, we have the ability of providing them with a companion or somebody to accompany the provider. Uh, we also made it known that we don't do house calls before the sun is up or after the sun goes mm -hmm. down. So we stress that to the uh, provide the nurse practitioner because we want to make sure to, to ensure their safety. Uh, Dr. Petila and I did a lot of house calls in um, Upper West Side of Manhattan, Central Harlem area. Uh, Fort Washington, we've been all over from the, you know, from the penthouse to the projects. So we know the, you know, the different uh, challenges that a provider can face when doing house calls. Although, by and large, for most of the house calls we did in New York City, we the community was very appreciative and even the neighbors will help you once they know you're there to see their neighbor they will go uh you know they will offer assistance uh there was one time when i couldn't get into the building and the patient uh didn't seem to hear that i was already calling the neighbors were yelling at the window <laughs> to tell the neighbor, let her in she's here to see you so the, really i think a lot of um families appreciate uh, the house calls. Yes, it is. It is a. It is more than a medical visit. It's a social visit. Yeah. And I think that that's key and uh, really important as groups are thinking about bringing this this practice into their work is that this is so much more than just one acute visit. It's really getting to know the patient mm -hmm. and yeah. social determinants of health that often are dictating some of the complications that you all are seeing. So Dr. Patella, you mentioned this, but uh, you know, considering that many of these patients are homebound, do you see them ever in the clinic as well? And how do you keep these home visits from hitting leakage? So um, um, once they're homebound, once they're um, being seen by our nurse practitioner, seldom, at very, on very, very few occasions, they would come to the office and I, it, mainly for me, from my experience, it would be some of the patients that I've referred to the house calls program because they couldn't come anymore to the office or it was very difficult for them to come to the office. But if they say they wanted an opinion on uh, advanced care planning, a second opinion on, let's say, a medical condition that was found, um, then, then they would come to the office. Um, and um, yes, I've seen, I, they would come to the office. But for the most part, they're very happy with um, with being taken care of by the nurse practitioner. And I think the fact that there is communication between the nurse practitioner and some of their primary care physicians may help. Um, so the trust is there. Um, yeah. yeah, well, leakage, of course, uh, can be a concern, but I think with the size of the program, I don't think we have that big a volume right now where we worry the big impact it would have mm -hmm. even regarding adjusting the accuracy of payment. Um, and I and, and that's why we've also been very clear that we do have a preference for patients who would choose to really transfer to the house to the primary care provider to the primary care at home provider to become their PCP. Uh, and for the transition, for the care management issue, uh, although we ultimately end up, of course, sending them back to their primary care physicians, um, most of these patients, though, are re really belong to the system. So for us in the system, it doesn't necessarily matter if they end up staying with us or they end up going back to their primary care uh, provider as well. That's an important distinction. Yeah. No. Um, yes, and most most of our patients actually, in terms of when they move out of the of the house calls program, it's mainly because they move into a nursing home facility when they are at that stage, or um, or if you know if they um, they pass they expire. Um, and we do have a high attrition rate. Our attrition rate is about 27%. That includes both um, expiration and moving to a different level of care. Or moving uh, out of state to be close to family. Yeah. Good to know. Well, um, you know, thinking about some of the ways in which we're engaging kind of a hard to reach population at times, you all touched on the technological components that have made it a little bit easier for you to stay in touch with those who you do house calls with. 
Uh, a question that came in was around uh, adoption rate for my chart as being a, a primary mode of communication. Did you find any barriers to patients using this technology? Was there any barriers to use by the uh, nurse practitioners and those doing home visits? Would love to hear a little bit about that and how you address that. Yes, I can I can answer that question. Um, most of our, the actual patients who are homebound, most of the patients are really not um, computer savvy. Mm -hmm. And so they, they really would not know how to access my chart. And so, and that's the reason why I think um, um, our NPs have provided a work phone, a cell phone. So again, it's not mandatory, but I think that they actually, our nurse practitioner said that it's just easier Dr. Till, to give them our cell phone and the communication is easier. They also do use the phone. They call in, um, they speak to that. So it's, it's important that you have a dedicated CMA that will be able to either pick up the phone or get back to them right away if they do leave a message. So yes, it's a challenge to get them on my chart. But those who are on my chart, you know, you are the patients who have, let's say, um, families who help them with my chart. Mm -hmm. So, but um, that could be a challenge in terms of making a telemedicine visit because these children or their um, families, they're also working and they may not be able to be there to do the, um, to assist with tele telemedicine visits. Um, so I think um, providing the cell phone, providing a dedicated um, telephone number and a dedicated medical system to answer the calls, because we do get a higher volume of calls from our homebound patients. But uh, the, the adoption rate that you have my chart, I think, is probably higher because for the patients who co are coming out of the hospital who are referred to us mm -hmm. for house calls, most of them are have been registered, uh, you know, in, in my chart because that's the process in the hospital. The moment they enter the emergency room, uh, there's normally somebody who helps set it up, uh, whether with the patient or the family member uh so and you know so that they can access of course results but also be able to communicate with uh their provider as well um there was one question here whether there's truly a big difference between house call and virtual visit there is because you know when you enter that doorway when you step through that door one glance in that the first room you enter gives you you know, a picture is worth a thousand words that, you know, the virtual visit will only give you a snapshot of one part of the home environment. The house call will give you better information. Uh, also uh, information about safety, um, but also who are the people in the home? Mm -hmm. uh and we'll be you'll, and also the medication reconciliation is so much uh more comprehensive we call it the the you know the medicine uh cabinet autopsy but most of those pill boxes are actually next at bedside right. and they go years and years without being thrown out uh so yes so there is a difference and then that's why Although virtual visits and tele I love virtual visits and telemed, it has really provided us with another way to access, provide access, but uh, there are just patients who really need to be seen as well. Yeah. Um, and also for patients who have wounds, it's so much easier to examine the wounds, to uh, provide, you know, you know, the right uh, management uh, because one, the patient is already in bed, you know, if they come to your office, you have to get them out of the wheelchair, you have to get them on the exam table and dress them. While when you're doing a house call, pretty much the family member will just take you to the bedroom and, you know, help you turn the patient and you could easily examine uh, if there's any pressure injury. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's helpful. And I know we have several other questions that have come in, uh, but I hope that you will connect with our speakers during the networking sessions as well as uh, through our network. Um, but wanted to just give you all a minute before we close out. Any any closing thoughts or any key takeaways that you would leave with your your peers and colleagues that are looking to do this? Work? Um, I think 
it reminds me of um, several years ago, the WHO actually had a set, I think one of the years where they said, healthcare is homeward bound. I truly believe healthcare is homeward bound. If you're part of an integrated system that still does not include providing home-based services to patients, it's really time to start on it. Uh, because the population is aging, uh, we know that if we want to serve the needs, provide you know the right care, the right time, the right place uh, for our patients, uh, you know, setting up home-based services like a house call program, I think, is important. Thank you, Dr. Patilla. Any closing thoughts? I, I do agree. I think that the moment you walk inside a patient's home. Um, when you sit across the kitchen table talking to them, going over their medications or um, examining them in their bedroom if they can't get out of their bed, you already know what the patient needs. Um, yeah. and you can't, you can't, you, it, it's, um, it, it's not something that we can just do on video visit. And we have, we have a lot of patients who are out there who are really needing to be seen in their own set. Their, the home situation provides an, an idea of of what the needs and what the needs are. Well, thank you to both of you for your time and for your expertise. It's very clear that you all go above and beyond for your patients. And to hear some of those stories of how you've made a difference is really powerful and inspiring. And I hope that other practices within our network can learn and adopt some of the strategies that you all have shared today. I know that we weren't able, again, to answer all of the questions, but wanted to encourage you all to email them to us to the PCF yeah. at Deloitte.com email address or if you are able to catch our speakers at some of these other networking opportunities, please feel free to connect with them there. Um, and as always, we would like to continue to get feedback from you all as we uh, design uh, future learning events and would appreciate that you uh, take a moment to fill out our um, our survey um, and uh, give us some feedback. And then of course, wanted to flag this additional resource that we have available for PCF that is focused all around home visits, house calls, uh, where you can learn a little bit more. So look forward to seeing you at future sessions at today's uh, meeting and would like to thank Dr. Patilla and Dr. Mahdi for giving us their time today. And we will see you all very shortly. Thank you. Thank you for having us.